I only have so much humor. It's in this stack of 3 life I go cards. <laughs> and you know what? I'm actually almost all the way through. So, no more funny after this. But today, we have something. What did one elevator say to the other? I think I'm coming down <laughs> All right, how about this one? What did one eye say to the other? What did one eye say to the other? <laughs> See you later? How do you do that? <laughs> Between you and me, something smells. <laughs> All right, nicely done. So today, we're, uh, we're going to be covering respiratory. And uh, we've got respiratory and then cardiovascular, and then we're done. Um, we'll launch right into some of the review, or review-like concepts, like we always do. First up, we're going to talk about um, an outline of what we're going to cover. We're going to cover some categories, some broad categories of respiratory diseases this afternoon. Adelictasis obstructive and restrictive pulmonary diseases. And then we'll look at some infections like pneumonia. Um, there's lots of other respiratory disorders, but like the disclaimer I give in every unit that we, we come to, uh, we're doing a general overview. And so we're not going to have the ability or the time to, to cover all of the possibilities. So the idea is to give you um, some, some broad exposure. Okay, so let's look at some terminology and let's look at some of the physiology uh, that you've had previously in 202. So this figure should look somewhat familiar to you on the right. Does anybody know what this figure is characterizing? I mean, shaking your head is a response, so that's good. Yeah, you know what it's characterizing. Okay, the next question do you want to share. <laughs> right? Understood. Who would like to, to kind of give us an overview of what, what this is? You don't have to walk through every segment, but what, are, what is it characterizing? Uh, the different volumes, what your lungs are capable of, so like what you can breathe out the most, or like the total volume, or how much you can breathe in total. Okay. So it's looking at various types of uh, lung volumes, right? Whether you inspire or whether you expire, okay, what your nor normal expiratory and inspiratory um, volumes look like in a, in a tidal volume, as we call it. It also characterizes this residual volume at the bottom that doesn't change, right? That's about 1.2 meters, and that's what keeps your lungs inflated. That keeps them open. So if you force all the air out in a forced expiratory activity, uh, you would still have left in the lungs, mostly in the alveoli or the bronchial network, you'd have this residual volume. Right? So looking back at your 202 physiology text wouldn't necessarily be a bad idea, probably a good idea. It'll help give you some ideas about, or reminders about, uh, how we move air and the types of volumes that we can have. And of course, if you have an infection, right, you have uh, mucus in your lungs, that's going to take up space. And as it takes up space, it goes above this residual volume. So the amount of residual volume that you have in your lungs during a lung infection increases, right? Because you have this residual volume plus now you have this fluid volume or this mucus volume, you know that? You know if you have that, you have a cold, it's called this productive cough, right? A productive cough is one that, you know, sputum actually comes out. A non-productive cough is the one that is like a hacking cough that never, never creates a breaking up of the mucus, okay? So some terminology as we get started. Uh, eupnea, <coughs> this is from a Greek term, eu, eu, meaning well. Um, well breathing is what it translates to, eupnea. Uh, dyspnea is shortness of breath. Shortness of breath. A lot of times it's abbreviated SOB, 
Now keep in mind if you're working in the um, emergency department and you know in room four there's a uh, that doesn't mean that it's a not a nice person. Okay, it means it probably had short of breath. I do remember the first time I saw that I was like, wow, this the medical community is extremely <laughs> what? Okay, just make sure before I walk into that room I'm a little careful. There's an SOB in there. <laughs> shortness of breath. So a lot of times you'll see on the medical charts, shortness of breath, abbreviated SOB. Orthopenia is shortness of breath that occurs while you're lying down in a horizontal position. So we have different terminologies based upon position. Hyperventilation is ventilation that exceeds metabolic demand. So you overventilate, hyperventilation. If you hyperventilate, you're probably going to blow off excessive CO2. That means you blow off excessive free hydrogen ion. And hyperventilation is going to cause what? From a acidity or basic environment of what? It makes it what? Alkaline. Okay, you blow off excessive free hydrogen ion. Hypoventilation or underventilating below metabolic demands, now you're going to become acidic. Hypercapnia is a word that means you have high amounts of CO2 in the bloodstream. Hypercapnia. Typically, that's going to then result in hyperventilation to blow off that excess CO2. Make sense? Okay, hypocapnia, low CO2 in the blood. Right, so probably slow down your breathing. Homophysis. Anybody know what the word homophysis means? Coughing up, Coughing up blood. Okay, so when you have a cough, it's a productive cough, there's sputum. If there's blood in the sputum, that would be homophysis. Cyanosis, we've seen this term before, but cyanosis is a bluish coloring to the skin and a lot of the epithelium. The mucosal layers. Um, cyanosis means that there's low oxygenation in those tissues. Um, hypoxemia. Hypoxemia is a decreased oxygenation of arterial blood. And hypoxia, which is a different word, hypoxemia is a decreased oxygenation of arterial blood. Hypoxia is a de decreased oxygenation of the tissues. So in different terms, depending upon you're talking about the blood, hypoxemia, or hypoxia, you're talking about the tissue. So if you look at the femoral artery, right? Femoral artery occurs where? Right about here, the legs. Okay, the <coughs> legs are just above it. If you took arterial blood draws from the femoral artery, you would be determining uh, this hypoxemia level. You'd be determining um, what's the oxygenation of the blood itself. If you put a probe into the quadriceps and you're measuring oxygenation of the muscle, then you're determining if, if it's hypoxic or not. Hypoxia is oxygenation that's low in tissues. Now, there's another term that's not on the screen. You should probably write it down. Uh, because these three terms usually get interchanged incorrectly. Ischemia. What's ischemia? It's referring to blood supply. It has nothing to do with oxygen. Okay? You can see in hypoxemia and hypoxia, you kind of appreciate the word oxy in there, right? Like oxygen. Ischemia has nothing to do with oxygen. Ischemia has to do with a restriction of blood flow to the tissues. Well, they're obviously related because if you have a tissue that's ischemic, it's probably hypoxic as well. Make sense? But in a clinical setting, the, the terms get thrown around all the time. So I just want to make sure we clearly define the three different terms. One's measuring arterial blood levels of oxygen. One's measuring oxygenation levels within the tissue. And the third one, ischemia, is measuring blood flow. Okay? We'll talk about ischemia next week uh, when we talk about cardiovascular. Okay, so 
Back to atelectasis, our first category uh, of respiratory disorder that we can look at. Uh, this is a lung collapse, atelectasis. Lung collapse that's due to an inability for the lung to expand to its normal capacity. So that in inevitably is going to reduce oxygenation. If you can't inflate the lungs fully, then you're not going to bring in as much volume of oxygenated air. And you're not going to have as efficient of a gas exchange over the hemoglobin molecule. And eventually, the blood that does flow to the tissues won't be carrying as much loaded hemoglobin. Okay, so we ultimately reduce oxygenation to the tissues. We have three different types. We have resorption, compression, and contraction. You can see these different pictures here. Resorptions are upper left, compressions are upper right, and contractions are lower picture. So each one of these. Resorption, this is usually due to um, uh, an obstruction an obstruction in the airways that prevents air from reaching the distal airways. Now there's already air in there, but it eventually it's trapped and it is actually absorbed in the alveoli <coughs> collapse. So in resorptive type of um, atelectasis, you can see in this upper left picture there's a blockage. And that blockage is preventing air from flowing into this top portion of the right lung. And so over time, it collapses because it's not being inflated. Compression. Compression is um, typically due to the accumulation of one of three mediums, blood, fluid, or air. And that is accumulating in the pleural cavity or that pleural space. And what happens is it, um, causes a mechanical collapse. So the most common scenario where air would show up there is, um, is where? How would you get air in that plural, uh, plural cavity? What's that? Getting shot, okay. Or stabbed, pneumothorax, right? Where um, the chest cavity is perforated and that plural space is compromised and then the pressure within that pleural space is the same as the outside atmospheric pressure. And so now you actually have too much atmospheric pressure on, on the lungs itself and then collapse. So compress it. But it could also be because of fluid. Now, where would we see fluid build up? Well, we're going to see that next week in next lecture uh, when we talk about congestive heart failure. So in patients where the heart's not pumping correctly, you're going to get a backup of fluid into the lungs. And eventually, that's going to leak out into the pleural space and cause fluid to actually sit on the lungs. Right? And that restricts breathing. So a lot of patients with congestive heart failure uh, will tell you it's very difficult to take a deep breath. It feels like you know um, somebody kind of has like a uh, an ace bandage wrapped around their chest cavity, and they can't really move air in and out very well because there's actually fluid sitting in that pleural space. Okay, blood would be the same example if you had blood in there. Usually, in, in a blood situation where there would be blood in the pleural cavity, um, either the patient's very close to death or is already deceased. That's when those. That's when that would happen. Okay, this fluid here. Instead of just blood, it would be a blood water. It would be bloody water because there's a lot of pooling of blood in that cavity. Um, the third type, the lower figure, is contraction. And this is where you have fibrotic changes that um, take place. Fibrosis. The fibrosis uh, prevents the lungs from expanding and it hampers the elastic recoil. Atelectasis, lung collapse. Okay, so let's look at another category of respiratory diseases called uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. 
But let's just back up for a second and look at obstruct, obstructive pulmonary diseases first. So if we look at obstructions, that means that there's a reduced airflow due to blockage. And the symptoms or the clinical events are going to be worse or they're going to be exaggerated with exhaling. Not that inhaling isn't compromised, but the bigger issue is on the exhale. And we can measure that. We can measure that with, with instrumentation known as spirometry. And that first figure that I showed of that upper right figure with the tidal volume, residual volume, a lot of those measurements are done with spirometry, where you, you know, breathe into a machine, a tube connected to a machine, and it measures <coughs> flow of air. Okay? Um, so there's four main types of obstructive pulmonary diseases that we're going to uh, discuss. Emphysema, chronic bronchitis, asthma, and bronchiectasis. All four of these are considered obstructive types of pulmonary diseases. Now again, some of you are asthmatics and say, well, when I wheeze, when I have an asthma attack, I wheeze on the inhale as well. I have trouble breathing in. That's true, but spirometry would tell us that the bigger physiologic effect is actually measured on the expiration. Okay? So the blockage that's taking place because of a partial collapse of the airways, and we'll talk about asthma, what happens there. We'll talk about whether it's um, allergy induced or whether it's uh, intrinsically induced, like exercise, for example. Um, that's a restriction of the airway coming down, causing a blockage, and so we call that an obstructive pulmonary disease. Now, the two that are on the list that are considered chronic, or COPD, are emphysema and chronic bronchitis. And the reason for that is they're really considered to be chronic in nature, meaning that um, the symptoms last for the rest of the patient's life. Now with asthma, for example, it's not necessarily considered chronic because most patients would have an asthma attack uh, and they would have an issue, but then they use a rescue inhaler. Or if it's really bad, they go to the emergency department and they get medication that causes dilation of the airways. Uh, they have a nebulizer at home, so they're getting, you know, a home nebulizer albuterol that's helping to alleviate the restriction. And it's un uncommon that an asthmatic would just live with asthma symptoms for the rest of their life. Okay, and just never go see the doctor. They would probably um, have periods of time where it felt good, periods of time where it was problematic, and they would go get treated for those times that were problematic. <coughs> now, with emphysema, chronic bronchitis, you're going to see. There are modifications that happen to the tissue, so they don't go away. There's not really a treatment, per se. So they are chronic in nature. So let's look at the first one, which is emphysema. There's a lot going on on the slide, so I'm going to walk through it um, one step at a time. The main issue with emphysema is a loss of surface area. That's what the SA is abbreviating, surface area. Um, within the respiratory epithelium. So it's not just the alveoli. The alveoli are, if you remember, they're like these sacs that exist at the very distal terminal end of the bronchial network. But we also have other respiratory airways that are um, more proximal to the alveoli. For example, if you look at this figure right in the middle, this cartoon drawing A, you can see the alveolus is at the very end, but the alveolar duct, you have the exchange of gas that takes place here as well, and you also have it in the respiratory bronchioles that feed to the alveolar ducts. So the entire respiratory network dilates out. Okay? It dilates out. So you, you lose surface area because it goes from this um, pattern it goes from that to that make sense? so the transition if you were to take this and stretch it out right you would have a lot more surface area because of these foldings but when you dilate out this respiratory network, you lose a lot of that surface area. 
So less surface area means less area for gas exchange. And so that's the main issue with emphysema. You get a loss of the elastic recoil. So it, the tissue cannot maintain the shape. Now, we can see in this histology slide up top, here is where we're coming in from the very top. This is where we're coming in from the respiratory bronchial. This is an alveolar duct coming down here. And you get this blowout or this enlargement. In some cases, you can see there's a gap right here. There, there, there's not even a connection in this alveolus. Over here, this respiratory bronchial coming out here, this whole structure was just blown out. It no longer resembles uh, an alveolar network. So you have a respiratory bronchial coming, diving into an alveolar duct to the left, diving to an alveolar duct on the right, and you can see the result of two main features sh showing how you go from this structure with high surface area to this structure with low surface area. Okay? Well, there's two main types of emphysema as we characterize them. The most common type is closely associated with long-term cigarette use, and that's centra acinar. So the centra acinar is more common in the upper lung lobes, the upper lung lobes here. And you see it really primarily affects the respiratory bronchioles. And the panna acinar affects more of the alveolus and the alveolar duct. So this histology example up top would be more representative of centra center or panna center. Panna center. Okay, because we, we were labeling these structures, it's really more affecting the alveolus and part of the alveolar duct. And the respiratory bronchial is pretty much normal, it's very top of the screen. So the panna center is more common in the lung, uh, lower lung lobes. And um, it's also seen in patients that have what we call an alpha-1 antitrypsinase deficiency. Alpha-1 antitrypsinase deficiency. So abbreviated alpha-1 AT antitrypsinase deficiency. No, this one is panacin. Alpha-1 um, antitrypsinase. So we have two different types of, of um, emphysema. The centra center is more closely associated with, with uh, long-term chronic cigarette use. Um, I have a, a recent anecdote I just want to share with you guys. So there's a family friend, uh, probably in his early 70s, just passed away, um, and he was a long-term cigarette user. Uh, and he passed from um, uh, cancer of the kidneys. But that was the secondary site. The primary site was actually lung cancer. So lung cancer, very commonly, uh, isn't necessarily what's going to take the patient's life. Okay. Uh, because lung cancer uh, will often develop a highly metastatic state. It'll branch off, it'll go somewhere else. And it's not surprising in this family friend, it ended up in the kidneys. Why? What do the kidneys do? They filter. So if the respiratory epithelium is highly vascularized, all it had to do was metastasize into the bloodstream. Eventually it circulates around. It would either hit the kidneys or most likely the liver. Two big filter organs. Okay? So it's not uncommon when you get out and you start dealing with patients, you're going to see a lot of lung cancer as the primary disease. And then there's a secondary site if it makes it to the bone, or makes it to the kidneys, or it makes it to the liver, then you know you'll probably have a little bit of an aha moment. Um, not that you know you should celebrate it; it's kind of awkward to do that. But um, it's neat when you can put these things together. And say, okay, that does make sense. Okay. So, cigarette smokers, there is definitely a risk factor associated here. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about more throughout the lecture of the risks of cigarette smoke as we kind of move on to, for example, this next slide. It is always a little surprising to me within the healthcare field, you drive by a hospital, you go around like the back part of the hospital, what do you see? You see all the healthcare workers smoking, right? And, um, you know, you just hope they're not like, you know, 
within 20 feet of like the intake um, air, air, airway or air ducts for the hospital. But it just always surprised me that folks that know this stuff are, you know, not worried about it. Or maybe they are worried about it, but uh, they're not going to do anything about it. Well, <clears throat> let's talk about emphysema a little bit. And uh, it is very true that there are two main ways emphysema can take place. <coughs> and there are probably more. But it's not super clear as to how it manifests. Now, for example, there are patients that you'll run into that present with emphysema, and it would be not appropriate for you to automatically conclude that they smoked their whole life. Okay? So patients do develop emphysema that have never smoked. How is that possible? Well, this is this alpha-1 antitrypsinase deficiency. So we know that there are two main routes, and I'll circle them here. You probably want to circle them on your slide. There's two main pathways. One comes in from the top, and one comes from the bottom. But they sort of converge in the same issue. The same issue is upregulating elastase. So these are patients that have an antitrypsinase deficiency. So how do you know if you have an antitrypsinase deficiency? Well, you could probably do genetic testing. Okay, you can do genetic testing and screen and determine if you're at risk for heart disease, red bull disease, cancer, what type of cancer, antitrypsinase, right? Uh, there's all sorts of knowledge that we have now, and it's sort of now, you know, we're entering that era of, well, do I really want to know, or do I just want to enjoy my life, you know, and just do the best that I can and, and try to make good decisions, but um, sometimes knowing exactly what's going to happen and when it's going to happen uh, doesn't necessarily make life that much more enjoyable. So you and I all are in this room, and some of us might have uh, a deficiency in alpha-1 antitrypsinase. You could get tested for it if you really wanted to. Okay? Um, well, what that really means is that you have this deficiency in an enzyme that blocks um, high levels of elastase activity. Elastase is an enzyme that breaks down elastin. And <clears throat> elastin is a stretchy protein that gives tissue its elastic recoil. The patients, you've seen this, there's other organs that have lots of elastin in them. Skin, for example. And are all seven-year-old patients' skin the same? No. You know, you've seen people that um, are seven years old, and you're like, you know, their skin looks like, you know, 50. Or you've seen people that are maybe 40 or 50, and their skin looks like they're 70 or 80. Okay, likely, they're in this category, probably some sort of deficiency in antitrypsinase. But you're seeing the skin result of elastin. You're not necessarily able to look into the lungs and see what's going on with the lungs. But it exists in all the tissues. It would happen in the aorta, it would happen in the bladder, it would happen in the heart as well. Okay, so if, if I have a susceptibility because I have low levels of expression of antitrypsinase, over time, elastase especially if I recruited neutrophils into the region that are going to pump out more enzyme, I don't have the ability to keep them in check. So what ends up happening is the tissue gets damaged because you digest away elastin, and you also release other metalloproteases that cause this sort of phenotype to expand out. Now, what accelerates this in patients is when you uh, chronically use tobacco smoke. Because this tobacco smoke is very, very high in free radicals, or these reactive oxygen species. A lot of contaminants, irritants. That recruits neutrophils to the area. They're actually encouraged to come in um, by nicotine's action itself, as well as the activity of these ROSs <coughs> like IL-8, um, Leukotriene beta 4, TN, uh, TNF alpha, um, and they recruit the neutrophils to crank out more elastase. If you have a patient that has a deficiency here and combines that with chronic cigarette smoke, they're probably going to develop emphysema relatively early in life. Okay? Well, if we um, look at some of the alternatives, right, these are becoming a lot more popular. Um, 
The answer is, are they saved? The answer is still, it's not clear. Okay, I mean, keep in mind, there was a po point in history when um, it was considered safe and not a health risk at all to actually smoke. Okay, and, and people smoke much more frequently than they do now. So, just because um, the medical community or society has deemed something to be okay, um, isn't usually a license for you to say um, it must be safe. That's probably a, a risky type of behavior. You, you're, you are now in a realm of being very educated. Okay, and so now you can make these decisions on your own. Um, these electronic cigarettes, e-cigarettes, and you'll see a lot more businesses now will say no smoking and that includes e-cigarettes. Okay, if you see that. Uh, because there's just, a, we don't know, there's not enough history to know what's going on. Um, they typically uh, use an atomizer of some sort, battery operated, so it heats a liquid that has the nicotine within it, and it converts it to a vapor, and, and that vapor is what is being inhaled. Okay, now it's true that the amount of contaminants is far less than what you see in cigarette smokes, a, a traditional cigarette, far less. Okay, does it mean that it's completely safe? No. Um, the manufacturers obviously claim that it's a safe alternative. They're, they're obviously biased because they want you to buy them. Um, the FDA has actually questioned the safety of these products altogether. It has actually said that um, they haven't, that the safety and efficacy has not been tested, so we don't know. What's that? They're they're, they're outlawed in China, even though they manufacture them. Yeah, that sounds like China. <laughs> it's conflicted with itself. Um, so the um, the FDA has done some limited testing already, and they have demonstrated that these samples do contain trace amounts of carcinogens and a lot of the toxins that are found in standard cigarette smoke. Okay, so it can't be that they're completely safe. Now, keep in mind, we used to paint our houses with lead-based paint. Okay? We used to spray asbestos into buildings. Um, so there's lots of things that we've done in society that we've discovered that are not necessarily great for us. Um, but you know, this is one of these things where if it was me, I'd probably want to know um, what all the I'd probably want to wait to find out what all the data was before I educated, you know, my 12-year-old that this is a very safe thing to be doing. Okay? And that's probably one of the more social issues is with younger um, patients and, you know, pe uh, pediatric patients, essentially, minors. They're getting their, their hands on these things, thinking that they're safe. Um, and, you know, parents that aren't aware that they may not be completely safe. And it might be worse that they're starting to expose them to um, habit-forming types of behaviors before they're even, you know, an adult. Um, and so that might be more of a social issue versus, you know, are you going to develop emphysema because you use uh, e-cigarettes? Don't know yet. Question? Um, on the last slide, it shows that it was the nicotine in the cigarettes that led to the production of more of the elastase. So would inhaling the nicotine make them as bad as... Oh, so, no, that's a good question. So what the nicotine does is uh, the nicotine has activity directly on the blood vessel and nicotine causes a vasodilation. So nicotine vasodilates the blood vessel, and um, that allows for it to be easier for a macrophage to get out. Because if you remember back to inflammation, when we vasodilate, you open up the space between the endothelium so the macrophage can squeeze out. So yeah, I mean, e-cigarettes are still gonna vasodilate, uh, still allow for that to happen. And if there are trace amounts of carcinogens and toxins there, that are stimulating macrophages to move, you may still see some of this type of activity, absolutely. Uh, but the nicotine main effect is on the blood vessel itself. Um, is the elastase release just one of the effects of the degradation? Yes. Of the yes. In general? Yes. Okay. So the question is, is the elastase release one of the results of degranulation of the neutrophil? That's exactly right. It's dumping out elastase and a lot of other proteases. That's a general response, but because um, this response is happening 
multiple times a day, every day for years. Um, that's an awful lot of protease activity in the lungs. Does that make sense? I mean, this is normally what a macrophage would do. You want it to do that. But this is happening in lung tissue multiple times a day. You know, maybe it's 12, 15 times, depending on how many cigarettes that person has, every day of the week for 30 years. That's an awful lot of proteins in one tissue. Okay. Um, you know, so then we always get the questions, okay, well, what about um, pipes? What about cigars? Well, here's the thing is they're probably worse. If you had a cigar or a pipe every single day, 10 to 12 times a day, right, it's probably worse. But the thing is with pipes and cigars is usually you're not smoking them as frequently as you do with cigarettes. So we see more of the issue in patients with cigarettes than we do with, with pipes and cigars. It's not that they're safer, it's just they probably aren't being used as routinely. Okay. So I mean, if you want to have a cigar every now and then, um, I, I don't think you're you know, dramatically increasing your risks of developing emphysema. But I mean, if you're having a cigar every day, um, or a pipe every day. Well, that you know, again, kind of like back to the liver lecture. You know, it's sort of, it, it, you know, anything that's being chronic over time uh, that you know is harmful probably isn't necessarily going to be a good idea. Okay, let's look at some of the clinical manifestations of emphysema. But keep in mind, there could be a patient that doesn't smoke anything ever and develops emphysema. Okay, it is just that they have a predisposition to a lot of protease activity. And there are other harmful environmental toxins. Not as much as in Flagstaff, but in big cities, speaking of China, right, or any other big industrialized city. You're going to have a lot of pollutants that show up in the air. So shortness of breath, dyspnea. They're usually classically referred to as pink puffers, because uh, with um, Pink puffers, these patients have to kind of lean forward like you see this patient displaying here um, in a sort of hunched over position to force the air out. Remember, this is an obstructive disorder. And so getting the air out is harder. So over time, they kind of start, they're working harder to exhale. Okay, they're working harder to exhale. So a lot of times, because there's more difficulty and they're working hard to <coughs> exhale, they actually lose weight. A patient with chronic emphysema usually has a lot of weight loss. They're very thin. Uh, they're, they're basically exercising every time they breathe. They tend to be barrel chested um, because of the increased use of their diaphragm and primarily for exhaling is the internal intercostal. It's respiratory muscles that uh, are trying to help facilitate the exhalation. Because it's forced, they get a little red in the face, and that's why it contributes to this pink appearance of their skin. Now, if we compare this to chronic bronchitis, this is a great slide that I really like. But it also, unfortunately, leads to maybe a, a, a bad conclusion, which is, a patient would either have one or they would have the other. They either have chronic bronchitis or they have emphysema. And that's not true. Many times you actually see them together. But if we're going to compare them and contrast them, we, we want to look at what we call a pure emphysema phenotype compared to a pure chronic bronchitis phenotype. So this is a academic idealist perspective if we're trying to discriminate between the two different clinical phenotypes. But a lot of times you're going to get something in between or something with both of these features. Does that make sense? So if I look at the pure emphysema on the right side of the slide, you can appreciate um, how this is pan in the center in nature in this particular example because uh, we've got mostly the alveolus being blown out, the surface area is being compromised. You get a loss of elastic recoil, okay, and um, you have less surface area 
by which to um, do gas exchange. If you look on uh, your left side of the slide, you'll see uh, chronic bronchitis in its pure nature. Um, so this usually affects the larger airways, larger airways, like the trachea and the bronchi. In contrast, emphysema affects the smaller airways. Pure chronic bronchitis, you're going to have lots of mucus secretion, lots of inflammation within the large respiratory epithelium. Okay, you'll see, we'll, we'll, I'll show you a, a histology slide later, but in the bronchi, in the large bronchi, what is that epithelium lined with? You guys remember? What's that? Ciliated epithelium, remember that? What does the cilia do? It sweeps what? Debris away. What, which way does it go? Up and out, right? So every time you <clears throat> just do that, clear your throat, you're bringing up a little bit of mucus full of dust <coughs> and bacteria. Okay? Yeah. Right Let's everybody do it, right? Everybody, because you know you want to, but now you're like, oh man, let's all just do it together. Right? One, two, three. <coughs> yeah. Better? And then you just swallow it. <laughs> yeah, that's the reflex. Right? You just, you know. Are you talking like this? All there, all there, all there. And then you spit? No, you just, you just brought up a little bit of mucus with some dust particles in it, and then you just swallow it. Right on top of that cheeseburger that you had earlier. So, you're going to see with pure chronic bronchitis, you're going to see in this next slide that uh, we lose that respiratory escalators, what we call it. Okay, we lose that. Um, emphysema, um, if we compare bronchitis to emphysema, we're going to see that um, uh, there's a persistent productive cough in chronic bronchitis. 90% of patients that suffer from chronic bronchitis are smokers. A large percentage of them are going to also have emphysema-like symptoms. So they're not going to just develop chronic bronchitis. They'll probably have both. We have three main types. We have simple, we have chronic asthmatic, and chronic obstructive. So simple is, here. all three of these we characterize as bronchitis um, if we have the following. We have a persistent productive cough for at least three consecutive months in at least two consecutive years. Okay, so that means that this patient, it could be seasonal. It could flare up in the winter time. Fine. So last all winter, last four months of winter. Okay. Um, uh, and it's only chronic bronchitis if it did it this winter and last winter. Make sense? And then might it might fade away. Or it might be like the second half of winter into the spring season. Bless you. And uh, and then it kind of subsides a little bit. But it's considered chronic bronchitis if it lasts uh, for at least uh, three consecutive months in two consecutive years. Um, so we can characterize it as either simple chronic asthmatic or chronic obstructive. Simple is there's mucus present, and, but airflow is not obstructed. That's the simple style. Chronic asthmatic. You have intermittent bronchiospasms in association with the mucus production. We're talking about excessive mucus production. You can tell when you have a chest cold versus when you just are typically clearing your throat, like what we just did. If you just do that, you can tell there's a little bit of fluid back there. But if you do that when you have a respiratory cold, you know that you're looking for a tissue or you know, trying to go to the restroom to clear your mouth type of thing, okay? So that level of excessive mucus production when you have like a respiratory cold is what these patients would be experiencing for like three months in a row, okay? Chronic obstructive, mucus is so thick it actually blocks the respiratory tree. Chronic obstructive is what, uh, chronic bronchitis, is what we see in our smoker population smoker population. Okay? So 
Some of you say, well, I've had bronchitis. Like that's what the doc said when I had this cold. Yeah, but you didn't have chronic obstructive. You had probably simple associated with a chest cold, right? Usually it goes chronic bronchitis before it goes to pneumonia, if you will, okay? Or you had um, <coughs> chronic bronchitis, which is the chronic asthmatic type, where you get some restriction of the airways. If you have asthma and you had a chest cold, it's very likely that you develop chronic asthmatic bronchitis. Okay, they're going to give you an antibiotic. They're going to give you a respiratory or rescue uh, inhaler. They might prescribe a nebulizer for home. Maybe they'll put you on prednisone or medrol, okay, to try to decrease the inflammation in your respiratory airways. And that's uh, bronchitis that would be categorized in this sort of chronic asthmatic stage. Uh, is this usually what CF patients start? No, that's uh, bronchiectasis. I'll talk about that here in a minute. Okay. Cystic fibrosis, what you're asking about? Yeah. Just a minute. Yeah. Uh, when do you, uh, like, people are genetically predisposed to these sorts of diseases? Uh, when do you start becoming symptomatic? When? Yeah. Oh, it just varies. Yeah. It just varies from every patient. You know, there are asthmatics that, you know, have asthma issues uh, every year and never develop chronic bronchitis. Right? And there are others that it's like every year they develop bronchitis. And every other year it turns into pneumonia. Okay? So it just depends. It totally depends. Okay, so what does it look like? Well, up top is our um, normal pseudostratified ciliated respiratory epithelium, right? Uh, this is what it normally looks like on top. You can see, here's our cilia, here is a goblet cell, here's a goblet cell, and that's what dumps out the mucus, and that lines these cilia. And they have a sweeping pattern that is an escalator to bring out debris. It's very effective. It's very efficient. Okay. Um, and in bronchitis, we see that there's a loss of that pseudostratified um, ciliated epithelium. Um, the loss is caused by smoke or air pollutants. Then what we see is we see this gene known as mucin gene turned on. It's triggered or upregulated. It's upregulated by these extra pollutants. And that increases the size of these submucosal glands. It usually begins in the large airways and then it will progress to the smaller airways. So if you back up one picture, you can see that pure emphysema is only the small airways. Pure bronchitis starts in the large airways and then it moves distally to the small airways. And what often will happen is an infection. And that infection can lead to like a pneumonia infection. We're going to talk about the end of the lecture today. So what you're seeing in the lower picture of this histology image is this is this respiratory interface right here. Okay? That's this layer right here. And all of this stuff, you see all that stuff? This should be on the lower right of the slide, this should be all white open space. Like you see on the top left of the top slide, that's all open space, that's the airway. This is the airway. What's inside of the airway? What do you see there? Stuff, gunk, mucus, right? Excessive mucus and debris that's in this airway. If you look submucosally underneath here, look at all of the inflammatory cells that are present, all of the purple dots. So you lose your cilia, you hypertrophy the submucosa glands, you increase the amount of um, goblet cells that produce mucus, you increase the amount of mucus or sputum that comes out, and you have a decreased ability to move it because the cilia action is gone. So it kind of just stays stagnant in there, and that's what triggers or is a um, a stimulus for an infection because it's warm, <coughs> it's warm, it's damp, it's moist, and it's not moving. It's just sitting there. Okay. Um, so clinically, what do these patients look like? Well, they again, this is pure chronic bronchitis. 
versus pure emphysema, right? The pure chronic bronchitis uh, is usually referred to as a blue bloater. Why blue, blue bloater? Well, they have a cyanotic skin. So their skin has this bluish hue because if they're not able to move the air as well through the large airways, right, they develop shortness of breath. They lower the respiratory drive. They retain quite a bit of carbon dioxide, CO2, because they can't exhale it as well. They become hypoxic and cyanotic. Now, um, instead, it's interesting, instead of being very thin, because the metabolic demand is high, they actually tend to be slightly overweight. So th this patient's heavier than our emphysema patient who's working harder and losing the weight. Um, we don't really understand why they, they tend to be overweight or obese. It might just be age of the individual. We all tend to gain weight as we get older. And unlike with emphysema, there's not a lot of increase in caloric expenditure trying to breathe. Does that make sense? Whereas the emphysema patient, even though their age match, um, they're, they're kind of exercising more because they're trying to breathe uh, and use more energy to breathe. They have a cough that, that uh, contains lots of sputum or mucus, and um, they actually have quite a bit of shortness of breath upon exertion. Um, there's a note here, it's very common to see the two together. So even though I show this slide, or we delineate them separately, it's very common to see a patient that has emphysema with characteristics of chronic bronchitis together, especially in a smoking population. Questions? Okay, let's take a break. That's obstructive pulmonary diseases, part one. Let's talk about part two after the break.